Welcome, everyone. So great to see so many people logging on. We've got Greg here. Uh, this is Andy. We're going to go through a few introductions right at 12 o'clock. Um, if you are logging on and you can hear me, you'll note that I've muted you. That's just for the first portion of the webinar, and then I'll be opening up the microphones as we progress through to the Q&A. So it's right up 12 o'clock. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, thank everyone for being here yet again. This is great. Um, Greg and I are very pleased to begin what's the first in a monthly series of progressive webinars and seminars that are connected to some of the courses that he'll be teaching and making available for open enrollment. Um, this first session, of course, is on Aristotle on virtue and vice. And Greg is going to take us through some excellent discussion here, some slides that he's prepared for the occasion. Um, there will be time again, as I've said before, for Q&A. But please feel free to post a question or a comment at any time in the chat window, even though I've muted all of the microphones. And I will make sure that those get addressed if they're technical issues and that we read from those questions um, during the Q&A in addition to opening up the microphones for further conversation. So um, again, Aristotle on virtue and vice dealing with certain aspects of the Nicomachean ethics. Um, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and ask you if you don't mind to advance the slides. So a little bit about Greg for those of you who may be new to Reason.io or new to Greg. Um, I am Andy Shaka. I am Greg's partner. Um, I'm also his uh, spouse. <laughs> so I'm a huge fan, obviously. Um, but uh, Greg is the president of Reason.io. Um, he is a specialist in putting philosophy into practice and helping people understand very complex ideas. Um, he is a well-known contributor to scholarship on Aristotle. Um, he's been teaching for nearly two decades, and he's been designing and teaching courses on Aristotle. Um, Greg is an expert in applying Aristotelian ethics in work. He works with individual clients, organizations, and institutions. And he is a popular online educator and an advocate of virtue ethics. I think many people have actually come to know about Greg through his YouTube videos um, and his really strong presence as a public philosopher. So we're just delighted that you're able to join us today. I'm going to sort of take a back seat now and uh, kind of run the machine from behind the scenes and invite Greg to go ahead and um, take it from here. Again, if you have any questions or any technical difficulties, just use that chat window and I'll be sure to address them right away. Uh, but thanks everyone for being here. And Greg, why don't you go ahead and get us started? So we'll, I'll start off by talking about what we're going to do in the webinar. Um, I've got a few opening questions for us to, to look at and to get us thinking about um, why, why we're looking at Aristotle in particular and how the, the topics that, that you see the list here that we're going to discuss fit in with some of our ordinary, um, you might say, regular person notions of, of moral ideas. So we're going to discuss a number of different topics here. We're going to go relatively um, shallow because we're, we're, you know, taking the time to, to cast a rather wide net. Uh, but we'll talk about virtue and vice in our contemporary culture and how that's different than the Aristotelian tradition. And we'll talk about virtues and vices as key criteria for making ethical decisions, for thinking about moral development. Um, and then we'll go into some of the, the real meat, key components to Aristotle's conceptions of virtue and vice. We'll talk about this great idea that he has of the virtuous mean. Uh, we'll talk about how he distinguished virtues by various subject matters. There's you know, a number of different virtues. Why are there that many? And then we'll talk about um, how we become virtuous or vicious. I've reserved about 20 minutes for Q&A and discussion. So what I'm going to do here in the first part is lecture. And then uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions or comments that we'll, we'll address after that. Um, so let's start with considering these, these questions. Um, the first one, you know, or first set rather, what specific people do you look up to and what is it about them that you value? That's something that is worth reflecting on from time to time, uh, that what is it about them that you value, those are probably going to be virtues. 
Um, another important question, what actions of a person are you willing to excuse so long as they aren't typical of that person? But if that person keeps on doing that sort of thing, then you're, you said that's enough. Um, those may be indicative of what Aristotle calls vices. Um, think about the own, you, you, yourself and what traits that you have um, that you consider morally good. And, and that you not only possess, but also display in action. And then think about how often do you do that, or how consistently. Most of us, myself included, uh, what virtues that we have are not entirely developed to the level that we, we might want them. And then think about this. When there aren't hard and fast rules or clear outcomes to choose between, how do we, in fact, decide what is right and wrong, good or bad, better or worse? Do we just go by a sort of gut instinct? That can get us in trouble quite a lot of the time. Um, virtue ethics actually provides us with some, some useful answers to this. So if you think about those questions, there are some deeper implications buried within those questions. Um, one of those is that we share... Uh, not entirely, and, and they're not always entirely clear either, but we have a, a core set of moral concepts and often language that goes along with it that correspond to various experiences that we have. And some of those experiences may be very positive, some of them may be quite negative, um, but these are things that aren't just a matter of theory. Uh, they, they have gripping points, you could say, out there in the world that we, we live in. Another key idea that you see running through those sorts of questions is that we human beings have some sort of enduring or lasting character or personality, whatever you want to call it, but something that makes us who we are. It's not the entirety of our identity. There's other things that, that fit into our identity, but it's, it's at the core. Um, so if we talk about a person being genuinely... Uh, just, you know, they, they, they seek out the right thing to do, um, they, they don't uh, cheat people, as a matter of fact, even the notion of doing that is something they would find repugnant. Um, if we want to say that that person really is just, then we would say they have a, you know, an enduring character. Uh, that en encompasses justice. Or likewise when we talk about negative character traits as well. And this leads to the third point. You know, we pick out specific traits or dispositions that, that people have, and some of these are quite positive, um, some of these are quite negative. Uh, one of the things that I think is very refreshing about virtue ethics, as a matter of fact, I've had this experience many times in the classroom, um, telling students that they, they actually have uh, the right, or if, if they want to be granted permission, they have the permission to say that some things are good and some things are bad. Um, we can sometimes be mistaken about what's good and bad, and we can be mistaken in applying those to specific uh, people and, and situations. But that doesn't mean that there isn't good and bad. And traits or dispositions that people have, likewise, can be quite good or, or quite bad. Um, the other thing that's, I think, kind of core to this is that there's a notion of bearing responsibility not only for the actions that we engage in, or another thing I should add here too is the emotional responses or motivations that we have, but also for the way that we are, for our, our being. When we talk about going back to the character thing, when we talk about having a, a good character or a bad character, that's not just something that shows itself in, in one situation or another situation. It's something that perdures through time. And it's, it's the way the person is uh, in, in the world and in relation to others and in relation to their own self. Now, we use these terms virtue and vice in the present, and I want to get over a few hurdles at the beginning um, that, that might cause some, some misunderstandings or confusions. So virtue and vice have some really clear systematically developed meanings in Aristotle's works. And I have not only in mind here the Nicomachean ethics, but also you know, the rhetoric or the politics. When he uses these terms, they have some pretty definite meanings. And these meanings are, are different from what 
I, th I would say most people using these terms mean or understand by virtue and vice. So I want to distinguish four things that are different from what Aristotle has in mind, just so there's no confusion about this at the start. And at, you notice at the, at the bottom of this slide, one of these is a rather new term. Uh, so <laughs> if this was five years ago, I probably would only have three terms here, or three, three things here that I want to, uh, to distinguish. But now we, we've recently added a new one. So the first thing is, you know, a lot of people use the word virtue in a rather loose way just to mean what is socially approved as moral or even as normal uh, as expected. And then vice would be the opposite of that. So they'll talk about um, people displaying virtue when what they really mean, according to Aristotle, would not be that the person actually has virtue, but rather that they're acting in accordance with, with something that's virtuous. Um, not everything that's socially approved is necessarily virtuous from Aristotle's point of view. Um, it's possible to have a very corrupt society or culture in which um, some things that in that culture are socially approved turn out to be quite, quite vicious, uh, and, and vice versa. There can be virtues that are unrecognized within certain societies. So it's not just about social approval. Um, the second thing that I want to point out is, you know, when we think about um, some, some rather restricted uh, uses of virtue and vice. Sometimes people will use the term virtue, uh, often just applied to, to women, uh, in terms of virginity or chastity. Aristotle does not have that, that sort of thing in mind. Um, vice, uh, on the other hand, people think of specific things that get called vices, like smoking or gambling or prostitution. And those um, could be those could be things that fit into an Aristotelian vice. For instance, if you, if you smoke too much, and, and nowadays we, we know that really smoking tobacco is bad for you, so you probably shouldn't smoke at all. But um, let's say we were back in the, the, the days when doctors were still, you know, uh, not prescribing cigarettes, but endorsing them. And we said, well, you, you shouldn't smoke four packs a day. You know, uh, if you do, that would be intemperate. That would be the vice of, of intemperance if it's rooted in your, your character, as it probably is if you're smoking four packs a day. Um, so it's not, that's not the sort of thing Aristotle has in mind. The other thing that you see in a lot of contemporary um, references to virtue ethics or teaching virtue, especially in K through 12 schools, are these listings of generic good person terms like grit or stick to itiveness or you know whatever whatever you like courage but there's no real analysis or explanation of what these things mean aristotle would say that's not particularly helpful you're just naming something you're not providing an understanding of it and then we have this brand new term virtue signaling um, which is is used uh, to criticize other people um, for acting or speaking or, or oftentimes writing, it gets used a lot in, in uh, terms of blog entries and, and social media, or emoting in a certain way uh, in order to convey being good or that others are bad. Um, that's really, it's, it's, a, it's a, a misnomer to call that virtue signaling. We should just call it signaling that you're good. Um, because it, it's possible to be good in ways that aren't really connected to a full-blown virtue. Um, but I, I do see why, why it, it, it's taken on the uh, uh, life that this term has, because it's very fun to accuse people of virtue signaling. So let's talk about Aristotle's meanings now. Um, virtue, the term that we're translating, is in Greek, arete, comes from the Greek uh, agathon, uh, which means good, and so moral virtue is moral excellence, is one way it's sometimes translated, or a determinate form of goodness. Vice, there's two terms that we, we often translate as vice. One is kakia, which is just simply the opposite, uh, means badness. Uh, mokthiria um, can also mean weakness, but it, it's used synonymously for, for vice uh, in many of Aristotle's works, so moral badness or some sort of defect you know, something is lacking where, where it should be or something is corrupted. And if we go a little bit further, the virtues and vices, and this is probably one of the, the most important points to stress, 
These are what in Greek are called hexes. The singular for this is hexes. We translate this as habit, but you don't want to think about a habit of like biting your nails uh, or of drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. You want to think of something that's a little bit more substantive, something that transfers from situation to situation to situation. So um, biting your nails could be part of it if biting your nails is how you deal with anxiety and you feel uh, too much anxiety irrationally in situation to situation to situation. That might be a vice in that case. Um, Aristotle provides us with some general conceptions of virtue and vice, and we're going to go into that fairly soon. But he also provides us with some specific analyses of each of the virtues and vices that he talks about. And this is, I think, where he's particularly helpful to us, because it's one thing to say, you know, what, what these are in general. It's another to tell us, well, what is courage and what is cowardice or uh, to the other extreme, what is rashness? Um, it's not just uh, a term, and it's not just being in the middle position. There's a lot of other things rolled into that. And if you read Nicomachean Ethics uh, books 2 through 4, actually 5 too, if you want to see one that's just about justice, you will see a lot of uh, very, very detailed discussion about how each of these virtues and, and its associated vices plays out. Um, you can also add to that you know, some of Aristotle's other works, but it's probably enough if you're first starting out just to plow your way through the Nicomachean Ethics. The other thing that I want to highlight is that his understanding of these virtues and vices is placed within a systematic, although not entirely systematized, framework of a moral theory. Um, so there's, you know, sometimes when you have questions about it, some of the questions may, the answers may be, well, you know, if you look at this other uh, discussion here in, in, in the Nicomachean Ethics or in another work, you'll see him clarifying the point that you're asking about. Unfortunately, and this is a, a little bit of a digression, but I, I'm going to mention this anyway, Aristotle is not as systematic as you might prefer him to be, especially in this sense. When he says, I'm going to talk all about X, he does usually talk quite a bit about whatever that subject matter is, but he'll also make a couple remarks somewhere else in his works that are relevant to that, that issue. Uh, and so it's often useful to read across the, the, as we call it, the Aristotelian corpus, that is the body of his, his texts. Um, now, one of the, the key ideas that I said we were going to cover in this is um, ethics with, with virtue as a sort of criterion or a standard. So Aristotle is one of the main uh, early representatives of what we call virtue ethics. His teacher Plato is another one, um, another rival school that comes on the scene somewhat after Aristotle, the Stoics. Uh, they are another example of virtue ethics. Um, we see a lot of different virtue ethics being developed within the Western philosophical traditions, all the way uh, going into the modern period. Um, same things are happening also in, in other, uh, you know, sort of, I don't even want to say philosophical traditions, let's call them philosophical currents, like massive rivers, if we think about Chinese philosophy, for example, or Indian philosophy. Um, so there, this is a set of, of traditions and approaches in moral theory, and virtue ethics went out of fashion uh, among academic philosophers, although not so much among ordinary people who, who tend to view things often in, in this way. But among academics, it, it sort of dropped out of the picture for quite some time. And there was a revival of it in the, in the 20th century. Um, and so virtue ethics became formally distinguished from several other main approaches in ethics. Uh, one, some of the main ones would be Kantian deontology, or um, various forms of utilitarianism, uh, certain rights-based ethics that have their origins, say, in John Locke or, or more recently in, in other theorists. Virtue ethics would be different from that. And what's, what's really distinctive about virtue ethics 
is that it looks at the, the virtues as being things that are intrinsically good and vices as intrinsically bad. So what this means is that it's not just our actions or our decisions that are good and bad or the outcomes of them. Um, although, it's, you know, that's not to say that those don't matter. Um, but our, our character traits and our overall character as a person matters as well. And Aristotle has no problem talking about a person being, in general, a good person or in general being a bad person or as having a, a good character trait on the one hand and a bad character trait on the other hand. This is something that's really central to virtue ethics. And it doesn't see those as good or bad just because they lead to good or bad outcomes or you know, some other criterion like that. This is taken as, as a sort of fundamental basis. So there's, there's two kinds of corollaries that go along with this. One would be that whatever helps you to develop virtue is good. And whatever leads you to develop vice would be bad. So, you know, when we talk about somebody being a bad influence on you, um, they would not only be bad in the sense that they're likely to lead you into vicious behavior, which will then eventually lead to developing a vicious disposition. Um, that, that's something that's sort of instrumentally bad. Um, you know, or we could talk about culture as being good or bad in these respects, or institutions uh, as being good or bad in, in those respects as well. Another really key thing to point out, and I think this is particularly helpful for those of us who are tempted to start applying uh, virtues and vices as soon as we learn about them, is that um, many of us are not actually virtuous or vicious with respect to some of these um, virtues and vices that Aristotle talks about. So we might not be cowardly, but we might not be courageous either. Um, in that case, we don't possess either the virtue or the vice, but our actions and our responses can be measured, or, or we can talk about using it as a criterion here, in accordance with virtue or vice. So if I behave like a courageous person in certain circumstances, that doesn't make me courageous. But that, does, that is something positive. That means that I did behave the way a courageous person would behave, at least part of the way. Likewise, if I, if I act uh, cowardly, uh, I'm not, uh, cowardice is not yet rooted in my character, but um, it's, uh, it, it's a bad action because of that. So what makes something virtue or, or vice? Aristotle provides us with a systematic conception of virtue and vice. Uh, some of the key points here are that the virtues really conduce to our, our flourishing or our doing well. The Greeks have this term eudaimonia, which is difficult to translate. And they realize our human nature and our faculties. The vices, as the opposites, do the opposite. They stand in the way of our development or even set it back. Uh, they corrupt our faculties and our, our nature. There's, there's more to it than that. Aristotle says that virtues and vices have to do with actions, they have to do with emotional responses, and they also have to do with types of goods. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the specifics of them. They also involve conscious and motivated choice on the person's part. So they're not mere reflex actions. When you, when you hear the word habit, sometimes you know, people think it's just about um, uh, practicing something until it becomes unconscious. Aristotle says, no, no, there's some consciousness, there's some knowledge. These are habitual dispositions to act and choose and feel and desire and think in particular ways. Um, now, the virtues, here we're getting to some of the... The, the other things that we want to talk about, the virtues are mean or middle states. They're between opposed vices. Um, and what, what tells you what that is? Aristotle says that it's right reason or practical wisdom, and rightly oriented de desire will inform the person and help them to uh, make that, that, that point. Um, now, let's talk about the virtuous mean and the vicious extremes. Um, this is a really key idea on Aristotle's part. Um, the virtuous mean, it, when you see the word mean, the, the, the Greek word there it, it means also middle position, mesotes. It's situated between two vicious extremes. 
And so it's sort of like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? You have one extreme, too much, excess. You have another extreme, defect, not enough. So as opposed to, say, a porridge that's too hot, too cold, just right, we can talk about our approach to particular kinds of goods or emotions as being um, just right. So here's, here's an example. Uh, you can see on the screen we've got courage in the middle. And courage actually has to do with two different emotions, Aristotle says. They're closely linked to each other. Fear, phobos, and confidence, tharos in, in Greek. And there's two ways to go wrong with this. Cowardice, you know, the person feels excessive fear, uh, more fear than they should, or fear at the wrong sorts of objects, and they lack uh, the confidence that would help them to deal with that. But notice on the other side, you've got this other vice, and there, it's, kind of, it's got a defect in one way, defective fear, maybe feeling no fear. These are the people who run into danger and don't even think about it. Uh, along with that usually goes excessive confidence. And both of these are bad ways of being, Aristotle says. He, he actually favors rashness. If you had to err on one side, courage is closer to rashness than to cowardice. But you, you see that, that what we want is what's in the middle. Likewise, uh, temperance, the control over the bodily appetites for physical pleasures. We have on one side um, the uh, vice of intemperance, as we call it, uh, or you could say lack of moderation. Um, and on the other side, we have a vice of insensibility. Aristotle thinks that you should have some matter of, of desire, right? You should, in fact, enjoy pleasures, but you should enjoy them to the right amount. The pleasure should not master you and force you into doing all sorts of things that are uh, bad for you or bad for others. Uh, if you don't enjoy pleasures at all, there's, there's actually something wrong. Aristotle thinks this is actually quite rare, but we can think of uh, quite a few people who are, we might say, ahedonic in our own time. Now, the mean is not just the middle position. There's also a number of rights, or in Greek is the term that he uses is de, uh, meaning ought. So the right person, you know, for example, when you get angry, um, Aristotle thinks you should get angry in some cases, but you shouldn't get angry at the wrong person, right? Uh, the right occasion or the right, the right you know, uh, uh, situation, the right motive, what, are, what, is, what goods are you driving at uh, in, in acting or feeling this way, and the right time. There's some times when it's appropriate and sometimes when it, it may not be appropriate. Doing the action like the person who is virtuous does the action is one criterion, and this sounds a bit circular, um, but and that may be something we'll talk about in the Q&A. Um, and the last thing I want to point out is sometimes the mean is more opposed to one of the vices. I, I pointed out that, that courage is more opposed to cowardice than it is to rashness. Um, the other thing that I, I didn't put in here is that Aristotle thinks that sometimes we have to look at ourselves and figure out, all right, which side do I need to lean towards the most? If I'm given to indulging myself in, in pleasures of eating, uh, maybe I need to be tougher with myself and push myself past the mean and more towards the, the other side, because I'll bounce back hopefully into the middle eventually. Now, um, Aristotle distinguishes a number of virtues by subject matters. And this is similar to what Plato, if any of you have read him, does with the cardinal virtues, wisdom, justice, courage, temperance. Plato also talks about piety. But Aristotle develops a much more sophisticated approach that differentiates other virtues that, that, that Plato didn't talk about. So virtues concerned with emotions and desires. We already talked about courage and temperance. Um, Aristotle thinks that there is a virtue of good temper or mildness, as it's called. And then this is one of his, these, these two next things are really major contributions. Virtues concerned with how we deal with wealth or property and honor. So on the one hand, we have generosity, which is on sort of a, a lower scale, and then magnificence, which, which is a public virtue. Um, when it comes to honor, we have the right amount of ambition, seeking out honor to the right extent. And then what he calls great souledness, or it's always difficult for me to pronounce this, uh, magnanimity, uh, megalopsuchia is, is the Greek for it. Um, that's on a much larger scale. And then notice that he also has virtues concerned with social life, truthfulness about oneself, 
Um, are you overly self-promoting? Well, that would not be truthfulness. Are you uh, underplaying yourself? That would not be truthfulness either. Good humor. Uh, Aristotle thought that, that be, having a good sense of humor was a, actually a virtue. Friendliness, which has to do with um, what you're willing to participate in and what you're not. And then he devotes an entire book to discussing the virtue of justice. Um, these are the sorts of things that we want to think about when it comes to these specific virtues and vices. What kind of treatment does Aristotle give? Well, if you look at the Nicomachean Ethics, you'll, you'll see that. And why are these helpful to us? Well, it's partly because of going into the, the details. Um, here's two of the reasons why it can be so helpful. He distinguishes motives, the why, when it comes to these virtues and these vices. It's not just winding up in the middle place. You want to be doing the right thing for the right reason. So he spells that out. And he also provides us a lot of interesting and useful examples. Um, you know, for example, uh, when he's talking about magnificence, he talks about house decorating. You know, when, when you're going to uh, the, the shop and deciding uh, how you're going to outfit your, your living room, that can fit into this, this particular virtue or vice. Um, the last thing that we want to talk about is how people become virtuous or vicious. Aristotle considers a number of interesting possibilities. Maybe it's just luck, you know. Uh, we hit the genetic lottery and, and we're just naturally kind people. Could be that the gods or some sort of, you know, other principle outside of our control uh, reaches in our head and, and changes things around. It could be teaching, you know, like studying Aristotle, for example. Or it could be habituation. And which one does he hold out for? It's habituation. This involves repetition of action and also, in some cases, emotional responses. It's through doing that we become a certain way, he says. It also can include education. Um, so, you know, reading the Nicomachean Ethics can't hurt, but as he'll tell you in Book 10, by itself, that's not going to automatically make you a virtuous person. Interestingly, Aristotle uh, considers music to be part of this. Um, and if we think about how, how closely music is tied in with our own popular culture, that might be an interesting thing to follow up on. Uh, it's also good to have models that are provided by other people to us. Um, Sometimes punishment, uh, colossus in Greek, is, is needed to steer people onto the right track, but you can only get so far with punishment. The goal in all of this is developing rightly directed desire and right reason in the person. And that's something that has to happen over time. It's not something that you can snap your fingers uh, and uh, it'll automatically be there, like, say, putting a chip into, into a computer. So, we have now reached the uh, time for q and A. I'm sure there's probably lots of, of questions, uh, so we'll, we'll take them in turn. Thanks, Greg. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, for everyone listening in, I'm just going to go ahead and unmute everybody, and uh, I don't think it'll get too crazy. <laughs> so, if you have a question, go ahead and speak up as you're being as unmuted, you're being here. unmuted here. Um, um, Let's see, I think... Let's see, I think Sounds like someone's like listening someone without headphones. Without I'm just headphones a, bit of feedback. a bit of feedback. If I could just ask anyone who doesn't have headphones just to maybe mute themselves and put their questions in the chat window or turn down the speaker there. That seems to have resolved it. Um, but uh, if there's anyone who has a question, go ahead and speak up. And uh, I will search the emails to see if anyone emailed anything new in. It uh, looks like Jim is also typing something. Jim, I'll go ahead and read that once uh, you've got it written. But um, if anyone would like to start, Please feel free. Now, uh, Greg, I'll read you a question that's just come in. It's from Jim, and it says, is it possible to determine virtue and vice apart from God? So for Aristotle, the answer is definitely yes. Um, he doesn't actually talk much about in term, theological terms in his works in general. There are a few interesting references to the gods um, later on in, in the Nicomachean Ethics, um, but they don't really get involved in, in uh, this. And, and in, a, in a way, um, this, is, this is following in the path of, of Socrates, who's you know, Talked, talked about as having brought philosophy from the heavens down to earth and, and focused on human affairs. Aristotle thinks that 
um, certainly the 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 aspect of rationality within us is something that is um, semi divine. It's it's something that that is uh, that elevates us above above the animals, but um, it's something that also has to be developed within us, and and we don't need to make any explicit theological discoveries or revelations or references in order to make sense of this. Now, later on, other other um, continuations of Aristotelian virtue ethics, once um, you know, Christianity comes on the scene in, in the West, also within the Islamic world, of course, we have uh, Jewish and, and Muslim and also some, some Christian writers. They will take Aristotle's framework and push it into a larger theological framework that will, um, in some respects, take Aristotle further than, than he intended to go. A great example, that would be Thomas Aquinas. But even somebody like Thomas Aquinas thinks that many of the things that Aristotle is teaching can be understood by natural human reason without any theological commitments. Thanks, Craig. Um, are there any other questions that we wanted to go over? I see a few other people are still on the line here. Um, please feel free to just jump in with any questions you might have. While you're thinking, maybe formulating your thought, Greg, we did get one question um, in by way of email, and I know you have resources that you're going to provide, and we'll talk a little bit more, too, about what the seminar entails. Um, but there was a question about where someone ought to start um, with Aristotle and understanding this topic. I know that we're referring to the Nicomachean Ethics. So do you want yeah. to just give a quick explanation of kind of how that fits into the other writings of Aristotle for someone who's brand new to this and really, you know, wants to just kind of jump in in a measured way? Yeah, I think really the Nicomachean Ethics is the place to start. Um, when it comes to Aristotle's works as a whole, um, there there isn't any easy... Uh, text to, to begin with, they all have, they're, they're all either somewhat difficult or, or very difficult. And we, we often start people off with the categories, which is a short work, um, but, but tends to confuse students. I know when I was an undergraduate, it, it really confused me until I finally figured out what was going on in it. And it's, it's not, if you really want to study ethics, um, I think there's no no point in, in not jumping right into the Nicomachean Ethics. I will say this, there is a, another major work by Aristotle called the Eudamian Ethics, um, which covers much of the same ground. As a matter of fact, three of its books are identical to three of the books in the Nicomachean Ethics, but it also provides you some nice supplementary points of view on things. Scholars are divided about where exactly uh, in Aristotle's history, which book came first and which book came second. Um, so I don't really worry too much about that. The other thing I will say, too, is like if you go on from the Nicomachean Ethics, you would probably want to also read his politics and the art of rhetoric, um, because those cover a lot of the same issues and, and uh, uh, give you, again, supplementary viewpoints on things. Great. So I think we've got time for maybe one more question, uh, maybe two. Um, it looks like we have a question here from Johanna who asks, might genetic mildness be an issue with courage? So um, I'm imagining by genetic mildness uh, you mean something like a tendency to, um, well, let, let, let's consider it in two different ways. One, one could be a tendency to avoid conflict, right? Uh, and some people are naturally more prone to, to avoid conflict than, than others. And then you might also mean something like just you know, being naturally nice to people. Uh, mildness is, is sometimes uh, characterized in that way. And I would say that, so, so Aristotle actually does talk about our temperaments and what he calls natural virtues, um, which are not, there's something that we're, we're, that, that, are, that we're born with in the sense that we have a certain temperament. Um, like some people are more irritable than others, and you can tell that already when they're a baby. But most of what's going on um, is a matter of 
how we shape ourselves. So if I'm already, I'll use it myself as an example. Um, one of the reasons I do so much research on anger is because I uh, uh, grew up as a, uh, an angry person and wanted to find ways to deal with it. I found Aristotle was extremely helpful for that. And I could say, well, I'm naturally angry, and so I can't be, uh, you know, I can't be virtuous with respect to anger. Aristotle would say, no, no, you, you can. It's going to be harder for you than it is for somebody who's um, naturally prone to overlook things and to, to uh, you know, uh, be nice in, in those certain ways, but it's still possible. You, you would have to do more work and pay closer attention to your, your uh, almost instinctive reactions to get them under control. And so with, with, with courage, if you, if you are naturally timorous uh, by, by uh, the way in which you're, you're <coughs> born or something like that, or we can think about what, what your culture has done to you, you know, it's still possible to reshape the, the person. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Greg, it looks like we've got a follow-up question uh, from both Jim and Johanna, and we may have to end there. Um, well, but yeah. uh, why, why don't I take the follow-up from Johanna and then come back to Jim's? Um, okay. So her her question then was, uh, she said, "Thank you." So habituation is going to be easier or harder depending on genetics. Um. Yeah, although I think that, that genetics, genetics doesn't do quite so much as we, we often credit it with. And this is actually a good launching point. You know, we, we often talk about nature versus nurture. And what gets left out of that, because it's not so easily measurable and it doesn't fit into the scientific paradigm as, as well, is our own capacity to rework ourselves in, in conscious ways um, to make choices uh, and, and sometimes to make dumb choices that, that screw us up worse, right? Um, <laughs> so it's not always about, about, you know, steering ourselves towards the good. And all three of those, you might say, in the Aristotelian perspective, um, they all intersect with each other. So like I pointed out, some people, yeah, are going to have natural propensities leading them towards uh, a virtue or, or towards a vice. Aristotle thinks that doesn't get you very far. Um, he says that the natural virtues, you really can't count on them much. You can count on somebody who has become habituated more than you can count on somebody who just has a gut instinct or, or anything like that. <clears throat> but culture also plays a major role because culture um, influences the ways in which we're habituated. If you think about our own culture um, that we inhabit right now where we've got all these screens in front of us that are bombarding us with with ideas and, and information, much of which is, is there to try to uh, arouse our desires. Um, that makes it really tough, I think, in, in some cases to develop certain virtues. And we have to, sometimes we have to, you might say, take control of the process. There's not much we can do with our genetics, right? We, we, we're born with the bodies we've got, but we can choose what we're going to do with the, the cards that we've been dealt. But we do have quite a bit more control over the culture that we surround ourselves with or that we allow into our, our homes and our relationships and our, our, our heads. Great. I think what we're going to do, Greg, since it's almost 12.45, we've got another question here from Jim, and we'll definitely get to that. Um, but just before we run out of time, would you be able to just tell anyone who's listening either now or to the recording a little bit later what they can expect in the seminar this Saturday if they're still debating whether or not they'd like to enroll in that? Um, oh, sure. I know we're going to yeah. do a deeper dive into some topics we explored today, but if you just summarize that and then we'll come back to the questions for anyone who wants to hang around and continue the discussion. That would be great. Yeah, so we're going to spend two hours, um, the, the last part of which will be a, a Q&A session as well, on um, some of the, these, these topics, going much deeper into them. So we'll, we'll talk about specific virtues uh, and, and you know, how this virtue is situated in relation to this vice. Or um, We'll talk more also about what it means for you know, rightly oriented desires or right reason 
Um, we'll talk more, I think, about the role of choice I involved in it. So that goes to some of these questions about habituation. And I'll also be providing some, some additional uh, resources uh, as well. And we'll, we'll break it up so that, you know, I'll go over a set of topics and then we'll have, you know, maybe five to ten minutes for a question and answer just on that and then j jump into another uh, set and then, you know, on and on like that. Great. And just for anyone who has questions about the platform, we'll be using uh, this same platform, uh, free conference call, and so you'll be able to log in to view and call in or log in and use your computer speakers, whatever's best for you. We'll likely start off with the oh, same sort of format where we have everyone uh, muted to start, and then um, what we'll do is just kind of take Q&A from there. Um, so, uh, Greg, we have another question, it looks like, from Jim. Yeah, um, I'm just going to mute. We've got a little bit of background noise here, so I'm just going to mute a few people. And then if anyone else is on the line and you'd like to ask a question, just feel free to go ahead and, and put a note into the chat, and I'll be sure to either open up your microphone or read your question for you. Um, but Jim's follow-up question is this. Um, what are your thoughts on what part evolution might play in the development of ethics? Well, that's a huge question. So <laughs> I'm going to give a, a really quick uh, Aristotle answer. Aristotle himself didn't um, take evolution into account, but um, I don't think that it's incompatible with, with Aristotle's view on things. Um, you know, for example, Aristotle thinks that we are what he calls social animals. That, that is, that it, it's very rare um, that, that a person truly is isolated from some sort of community. That doesn't mean that they get along with everybody. <laughs> In most cases, they, they don't. But um, we, we have developed to be creatures that, that interact with each other. Um, and that has brought about a lot of challenges that, that ethics uh, you know, has to respond to. I think that by the time that we get to theorists like Aristotle, um, I mean, he could say that you know evolution uh, reveals to us certain aspects of of our our nature, but then he's not all about um, you know sort of just following our nature. We're we're effectively reshaping our nature so that we realize it more fully, um, and that I think that's probably about as far as we could go in terms of talking about evolution, because again, Aristotle doesn't uh, connect up with that too much. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments that anyone would like to make? We've got just a minute here. We went a little over time, but it's kind of hard to <laughs> stop talking about it when we're also engaged. So um, this is really great. Greg, obviously this is um, an excellent you know, sort of departure point for us. Just a reminder for everyone, the two-hour online seminars will be held this Saturday, uh, one at 10 a.m. Central and one at 4 p.m. Central. Um, there's going to be a follow-up online course. Greg will sort of close us out by telling us a little bit more about that and about the resources that he has for us, including the playlist on YouTube. Um, in the general comment space, I've just put um, a little note with my email, andy, A-N-D-I, at reasonio.com. If you have any questions, comments, or follow-up requests, you can always email me. Um, I look forward to seeing some of you who've already signed up for the seminar in the seminar on Saturday. And if you have any technical uh, questions prior to Saturday, please feel free to email those as well. Um, I know there was a question about iPad versus phone use. Um, free conference call is excellent, I think, in Chrome. But I know that some devices treat the interface a little bit differently. Um, so I would always recommend logging on from a, a web browser. And Greg will be sharing uh, both visual content and a slide deck very similar to what you see today. Um, so you will want to have the opportunity to see, not just hear. Um, but any problems with that, I'm sure we can solve them. And you can email me. Again, andy, A-N-D-I, at reasonio.com. And Greg, why don't you just close this out with a few final notes. Um, thanks again to everyone for being here. And uh, um, we hope to see you on Saturday. Sure. So as Andy mentioned, we have the, the uh, seminars coming up, um, but I also have been developing some much larger online courses, um, and I split it into two 
different courses in parks. I don't want students to be totally overwhelmed with how much material is there. These are in our Reason IO Academy. Um, so I, I, we're doing Aristotle's Nicomachean and Ethics books one through five, and then six through ten. And with each of these, there's a number of lecture videos, uh, handouts, uh, lesson pages, uh, usually a quiz for each of the books, um, discussion forums. It's, you know, sort of uh, regular online courses. And, and uh, so if you like the kind of stuff that I do here, you may want to check that out. The other thing is I, I do have um, an Aristotle playlist in my main YouTube channel. Some of you may have come across it already. I was just checking on it today. It's got over 100 videos in it. Uh, it's been, uh, been adding quite a bit to it. Uh, it's kind of, it's always funny to see just how much stuff there is in those. Um, and I'm still continually adding more videos because I'm, I'm doing uh, core concept videos on Aristotle's um, categories. So if you're having trouble with that text, you'll, you'll want to check those out. Um, as Andy mentioned, if there's any issues, uh, go ahead and, and email her. You see her email here. She's uh, just a whiz at, at all of these uh, sorts of technical things that are, that are way beyond me. Um, we're, we end up being a great team together, and uh, I'm really happy to have put this on. So thanks to everybody for attending and uh, for your questions. I really enjoyed this, and we'll be doing many more of the, these uh, in the months to come. Thanks, Greg. Have a great day, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you in the seminar space uh, or email me. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.